Hello, and welcome to World of Warbirds. I'm Brian Pierce. Remember, you can always check out the pictures on the World of Warbirds Facebook page in order to see the various aircraft described today. If the Avril Lancaster had a motto, perhaps it would be, if at first you don't succeed, try, try again. Or, perhaps to be more accurate, if life hands you a lemon aircraft, try adding two more engines. Let's take a look at the origins of this iconic British aircraft. Elliot Verdon Rowe was born in 1877 in Lancashire. He was quite a character, and an adventurer as a young man. He left home at the age of 14 to go to Canada to learn a trade as a surveyor. He got all the way out to British Columbia when the collapse of the silver market meant that there was no more demand for surveyors. He did odd jobs for a while and then returned to England, working on a railway and then trying to join the Royal Navy to study marine engineering at King's College, London, but his entrance exams weren't good enough, and he was rejected. So he started working at the dockyards, and eventually signed aboard the ship SS Jebba of the British and South African Royal Mail Company on the West African run. Supposedly, it was at sea, observing soaring albatrosses where Verdon Rowe developed his interest in aviation, and returning from sea in 1906, he began his career in this field by applying for the job of secretary of the Royal Aero Club. There were candidates who were more qualified than Verdon Rowe, however, he must have really wowed them in the interview because he got the job mainly due to his enthusiasm. Incidentally, the man who hired him was Charles Rolls, who was the first half of Rolls-Royce. Verdon Rowe started off as a draftsman and then started designing and building his own models. Only four years later, on the 1st of January 1910, Elliot Verdon Rowe and his brother formed their own business, the A.V. Rowe Aircraft Company, which was later renamed to Avro. The company's most popular early model was the 504 biplane, which was used during the First World War and then was used as a trainer by the RAF after the war. They built over 8,000 of them. In 1928, he sold his share of Avro and bought the S.E. Saunders Company and formed Saunders Row. In the 1930s, he actually became a supporter of Oswald Mosley and a member of the British Union of Fascists. Both of his sons joined the Royal Air Force during the Second World War, and both were lost in action. His son, Leighton, was shot down while flying a Lancaster over Duisburg. Design and Development In 1936, the British Air Ministry put out specification P.13-36 for a capable medium bomber for worldwide use. This specification requested an aircraft with an all-metal construction, a mid-mounted cantilever monoplane wing, and the hope was to use the Rolls-Royce Vulture engine, which was in development at the time. Initially, at least, the Vulture engine looked very promising. Its design was an X-24 configuration, which basically took two Rolls-Royce Peregrine derived V-12 blocks and arranged them in an X shape, all turning a common crankshaft. This super engine was supposed to produce 1,750 horsepower, which would mean that two engines would be sufficient to power the new big bomber. Avro designed and submitted an aircraft that was called the Manchester. With the dark clouds of a new world war looming, the Avro Lancaster was designed to be built fast and repaired easily. If you've never seen one, but you have seen a Lancaster, just think of the Lancaster with two engines missing and a corresponding shorter wing. The fuselage was all metal, with a flush riveted skin of aluminum alloy to reduce drag. The wings had two spars, and fuel was contained in several self-sealing fuel tanks and all within the wings. This was intended to allow the biggest bomb bay possible in the fuselage. The tail was a twin 
thin and rudder configuration, which allowed for great vision for the dorsal gunner. In the cockpit, the pilot and flight engineer had excellent all-round vision under the expansive canopy. The navigator was seated behind them and had an astrodome for use of a sextant for taking star shots. The bomb aimer's station was inside the aircraft's nose, behind the forward turret, and the optical bomb sight was housed in his compartment. The bombs were housed on bomb racks inside a massive internal bomb bay. Originally designed in order to be able to carry two naval torpedoes, the bomb bay covered nearly two-thirds of the underside of the fuselage. The Air Ministry thought that it had a winner with the Manchester, and in February 1937 it was selected as the primary candidate for production and ordered right off the drawing board with Handley Page's aircraft, which was to be named the Halifax, and the short Stirling were named as second string. In August 1940, the first Manchesters began being delivered to the RAF, and they became fully operational by November. However, by spring 1941, the RAF was already having major problems with their Manchesters. It turns out that the Vulture was just not producing the promised amount of horsepower, which meant that the heavy airplane was always underpowered, even when both engines were running. And that leads us to the next problem with the Vulture. The X-type configuration had difficulties with lubrication and in dissipating heat. Worst of all, the connecting rods were too weak, which led to failures. Here is a quote from a crew member to be found in Before the Lanks, Early Days, Personal Stories, published by the Bomber Command Association. Open quote. I have seen an aircraft doing a run-up on the ground and have two pistons come right out through the side of the engine. The original bearings were made without any silver as an economy measure, so they weren't hard enough. The bearings would collapse, the connecting rod and the piston would fling out through the side of the engine, and bang, your engine just destroyed itself. Close quotes. Although about 200 Manchesters were built, and they did fly in combat, the lack of power and engine reliability meant that the type was doomed. They were withdrawn from operations in mid-1942. Prototypes In 1940, even as the first production Manchesters were being delivered to the RAF, Avro's chief design engineer, Roy Chadwick, began working on improving the Manchester design. He decided to try changing out the Manchester's two troublesome Vulture engines and swapping in four less powerful but more reliable Rolls-Royce Merlin engines installed on a larger wing. This prototype, serial number BT-308, was initially designated as the Manchester 3. It was later renamed the Lancaster. On 9 January 1941, test pilot H.A. Sam Brown took the prototype up for its maiden flight at RAF Ringway, Cheshire. The airplane was a hit from the start, and almost immediately, Manchester fuselages were being diverted from their production line to be switched to the new Lancaster model. Production The initial contract was for 1,070 Lancasters. However, soon enough, the RAF was demanding as many of the type that could be produced. Other companies were soon brought in to build Lancasters. Avro built the most at over 5,000. However, Armstrong Whitworth, Austin Motors, Metropolitan Vickers, and Vickers Armstrong also built them. In all, over 7,300 Lancasters were built during the war. In August 1942, a Lancaster Mark I, serial number R5727, built by Avro Aircraft, took off and flew west across the Atlantic in order to be a pattern aircraft for Lancaster production at the Victory Aircraft Company in Canada. It seemed an almost impossible task. The new company was to somehow figure out how to build and put together the 50,000 separate parts of the Lancaster and to do it with a newly hired and mainly unskilled workforce. Amazingly enough, 16 months after starting, the first Canadian Lancaster, serial number KB700, 
named Ruhr Express, was rolled out and flown to Europe to participate in the battle. The workforce of building Lancasters at the Malton, Ontario factory had ballooned from 3,000 to almost 10,000, and at its peak they were building a new bomber every day, in the end building over 400. The Canadian Lancasters had U.S.-built Packard Merlin engines, and there were several differences in, in instrumentation and turrets that were available in North America. Overall, the Lancaster was an exceptional aircraft, being described as a near-perfect airplane for its size and its type. It was fast for its massive size and very smooth in flight. Pilots described it as handling like a fighter and a fairly easy airplane to fly. Lancasters were able to be looped and barrel rolled and sometimes they could even outmaneuver their Luftwaffe attackers. They were very strongly built and could take a lot of punishment and still come home, even able to limp home back to base on two engines. One complaint about the Lancaster was that the wing spar, which went right through the fuselage, was a major obstacle to moving about the aircraft. Another problem was that the escape hatches were too small, making the Lank much harder to escape from if it came time to bail out. The depressingly low statistic was that only 15% of downed Lancaster crew were able to bail out. As a comparison, the Lancaster's sister RAF bomber, the Handley Page Halifax, 25% of downed air crew were able to get out successfully. While in American bombers, 50% of their crews were able to get out, although most of these escapes were done in daylight when it was easier to find the hatch to get out. The standard crew of a Lancaster was seven, the pilot, and beside him, the flight engineer. The flight engineer's position was equipped with instruments to manage the engines and fuel system. Below them, in the nose, was the bomb aimer. During the bomb run, he laid prone on the floor, looking at the bomb site. The rest of the time, he manned the Fraser Nash FN5 nose turret, which mounted two 303 caliber machine guns with 1,000 rounds per gun. Behind them sat the navigator at a desk facing port or left, behind a curtain so that he could use a light to see his maps and charts and do his calculations and see the instrument panel in front of him showing airspeed, altitude, etc. To the left of the navigator was a stack of radio equipment and the wireless operator sat behind that, facing forward, just in front of the main spar. He had a window to his left and the astrodome was above him, which was used for visual signaling or when the navigator needed to do a star shot for celestial navigation. Behind them was the mid-upper gunner, who sat on a canvas sling beneath his turret. He also had 1,000 rounds per gun for his two 303 caliber machine guns. Way in the rear was the tail end Charlie rear gunner with four 303 machine guns. Due to the Luftwaffe's rear approach technique, this gunner position proved to be the most important in the whole aircraft and several modifications were made over the course of the war to try to make it more effective. Some gunners removed portions or the entire perspex panel in order to have a better view to look for night fighters. The Rose turret, which mounted two 50 caliber machine guns for greater punch, was installed on a select few Lancasters and some late war aircraft, these guns were guided by radar. One of the biggest advantages of the Lancaster was its massive 33 foot long bomb bay, which seemed to be able to hold everything, including the proverbial kitchen sink. Of course, the Lancaster could haul 500 and 1,000 pound general purpose high explosives bombs, but it could also carry the 4,000 pound high capacity bomb, which was known as a cookie. And with modifications such as bulged bomb bay doors, it could also carry 8,000 pound or 12,000 pound cookies. It could also carry the SBC or small bomb container, which held between 24 to 236 4 or 30 pound incendiary and explosive bomblets. If that wasn't enough, it could also carry anti-shipping mines, anti-submarine depth charges also. And if all that wasn't enough, 
the Lancaster was the delivery aircraft of choice for several very special bombs, such as the Wallace or Upkeep bouncing bomb, the Tall Boy, and the Grand Slam. More about that later. Number 44 Squadron, which was based at RAF Waddington, Lincolnshire, became the first RAF squadron to convert to the Lancaster in early 1942. And the first actual mission of the aircraft was on the 2nd of March, 1942, when Lancasters from this squadron dropped naval mines in the vicinity of Heligoland Bight. Eight days later, on the 10th of March, 1942, they were on their first actual bombing mission, which was an attack on the German city of Essen. During the course of the British night bombing offensive, increasing numbers of Lancasters became available, but due to their superior performance, the RAF and bomber Harris really would have preferred to have even more. He went so far as to call it Bomber Command's Shining Sword. There was even much debate whether to convert the factories from building Handley Page Halifaxes over to Lancasters. There were clear advantages to the Lank over the Halifax. Unlike the almost fighter-like performance of the Lancaster, the Halifax had an annoying rudder problem that, even with modifications, never really went away. If a Halifax pilot threw his machine into a dramatic maneuver in order to try to escape from flak or night fighters, they were likely to unbalance, lock on, and eventually produce a spiral dive from which it was difficult to recover. Overall, Lancasters were slightly faster, had a higher ceiling than the Halifax, which was important in avoiding attack, the Lancaster's exhaust flames were less visible at night, and Bomber Harris was known to complain that he had to use his lanks as a safety blanket to protect the more vulnerable Halifaxes. Lastly, the whole point of this offensive was to deliver the most weight of bombs to the enemy, and in this purely numerical statistical analysis, the Lancaster was the clear winner. The Halifax's bomb bay was smaller and divided into sections, meaning that it was incapable of carrying the big 4,000-pound cookie bombs or any of the exotic bigger weapons of the RAF. On average, over its operational life, the Lancaster would deliver 150 tons of bombs on German targets, while a Halifax would only deliver 100. It also took less labor to build a Lancaster. It took 330 man-hours to build a Lancaster, while it took 420 man-hours to build a Halifax. So why didn't Britain stop building Halifaxes and convert over to all Lancaster production? The main problem was that of conversion. If the British aircraft industry was to start converting its production to Lancasters, then there would be an overall drop in bomber production during that time while the factories rejigged. For the British leadership, all the way up to Churchill, this was unacceptable. Also, there was some worry that there wouldn't have been sufficient Merlin engines to equip any more Lancasters. The Halifaxes used an alternate engine, which was the Bristol Hercules. In fact, the worry of Merlin engine supply was so serious that the Lancaster B-2 version was developed to use this alternate engine. So, if you see a picture of a Lancaster with radial engines, you're seeing one of the 300 built using the Bristol Hercules. There are some warbirds that during the course of the war are asked to do more and more and seem to accept modification after modification and just keep on doing good work. The Lancaster was one of them. Some variants had bulged bomb bay doors to carry the giant 12,000 pound tall boy bombs. The bomb bay doors were completely removed to carry the enormous 22,000 pound Grand Slam bomb. Speaking of special bombs, 23 Lancasters were built to carry the bouncing bombs, codenamed Upkeep, for the now famous dam busting raids. For this very unique mission, the bomb bay doors were removed and special mounts were inserted to carry the bomb. A hydraulic motor, which had formerly been used for the mid-upper turret, was fitted to spin the bomb. What about the mid-upper turret? It had been removed to save weight. Lamps were fitted into the bomb bay and nose for the simple, yet very effective, height measurement system 
which allowed for the accurate measurement of low flying altitude at night. The Lancaster was even considered to carry the atomic bomb to Japan before being rejected in favor of the B-29. Lastly, Lancasters were also involved in missions of mercy, dropping food packages instead of bombs to the starving masses near the end of the war. Look for a future World of Warbird episode where we'll talk about the special weapons and missions of the Lancaster. Some Lancasters were modified for air-sea rescue with an air-droppable lifeboat carried in an adapted bomb bay. Observation windows were also added to fuselage. There was a modification for photographic reconnaissance with all the armament and turrets removed and cameras carried in the bomb bay. We've already mentioned the Lancaster 10, which was the Canadian built version with Packard built Merlin engines and the use of Canadian and US made instruments and electronics. Some of them had a Martin 250 CE turret installed instead of the Nash and Thompson version. The Martin turret was the same kind that was installed on the US Martin B 26 Marauder, Consolidated B 24 Liberator, and Douglas A-20 Havoc. You know that a warbird is really special when the original design spawns even other types of warbirds. The Lancaster is extra special as its basic design ended up spawning a veritable flock of other war and post-war birds. In 1945, the Lancaster design was modified to such an extent that the new aircraft was named the Avril Lincoln even though the type doesn't look that much different. The wings were lengthened, and new two-stage supercharged Rolls-Royce Merlin 85 engines were fitted. The fuselage was enlarged so that it could carry increased fuel and bombs, including the Grand Slam. With these modifications, it would also be able to fly higher and farther than the original Lancaster, with a maximum altitude of 35,000 feet and a maximum range of 4,450 miles. A few more than 600 Lincolns were built. A further spawning was the Avril Shackleton, which was the long-range maritime patrol version of the Lincoln. Rolls-Royce Griffin engines with 13-foot diameter contra-rotating propellers replaced the Merlins, and many changes were made for anti-submarine warfare operations including the installation of special cameras and radars, equipment to drop sauna boys, and a diesel fume detection system to sniff for subs recharging their batteries. It could also carry up to nine bombs, three homing torpedoes, or depth charges, and had two 20 millimeter cannon in a Bristol dorsal turret. 185 of them were built, and the last one retired in 1991. The Lancastrian was a passenger and male version of the Lancaster. The early ones were conversions, however, later versions were built as pure passenger planes. Even though the type was not well suited for passengers, being fairly cramped in the fuselage, they continued in service until 1960. The Avro York was the transport version of the Lancaster. Although 258 of them were built, production was slow at the start as priority for materials and production was all devoted to the bombers. One of the prototypes, serial number LV-633, also known as Ascalon, was the personal transport and flying conference room for Prime Minister Winston Churchill. Avro Yorks were also employed after the war during the Berlin airlift. Lastly, the Lancaster airframe was so versatile that it was used as a test bed for many new engines, including the Metropolitan Vickers F2 turbojet, the Armstrong Sidley Mamba, various Rolls-Royce Dart turboprops, the Avro Canada Orenda, and Swedish Stahl Dovern turbojets. Survivors. We are lucky enough to have many surviving examples of the Lancaster. Some are just on display, at least one is able to taxi around, giving rides to the public, and two are airworthy. One of these, PA-474, 
was built in 1945 and arrived on the scene too late for wartime service. She is now part of the Battle of Britain Memorial Flight in the UK. If you've listened to the previous episode called The Love of the Lancaster, then you've heard me refer to Vera, the Canadian Warplane Heritage Museum's Lancaster. The squadron and aircraft ID painted on her flanks are VR-A, hence the nickname Vera. As I have actually seen this aircraft in action multiple times, and her picture is the front page of the World of Warbirds podcast, I will be profiling her today. Lancaster Mark 10, serial number FM-213, was built at Victory Aircraft in Malton in July 1945 and was taken on strength by the Royal Canadian Air Force on August 21. Built too late to participate in the war, she was immediately placed in storage at the RCAF base in Trenton, Ontario. Five years passed until she was called on to actually serve her country. In 1950, with the Cold War heating up, it was decided that Canada needed more aircraft to patrol its expansive shorelines, and so the decision was made to convert about 70 Lancasters into maritime patrol and reconnaissance aircraft. In January 1952, FM-213's conversion to 10MR, or Maritime Reconnaissance Aircraft, was complete. A radar operator station had been added in the rear center section, as had a Sonoboy operating station in the rear section. Several cameras and observation windows had been installed, and only the nose and tail guns were retained. A 400-gallon fuel tank for long-range patrol duties had been added in the bomb bay. She was assigned to number 405 Maritime Reconnaissance Squadron in Greenwood, Nova Scotia. On January 24, 1952, while on approach back to RCAF Trenton, she stalled and ground looped. Her starboard landing gear collapsed as she hit the runway, and a post-crash inspection revealed that her center section was badly damaged and needed to be replaced. The problem was that by 1952, the supply of spare parts for Lancasters had dried up and there didn't seem to be any center sections available. It seemed that FM-213 was about to be written off and scrapped. However, Bud found one of the men who had been responsible for looking throughout the country for spare parts for the conversion project, remembered seeing an abandoned derelict lank, formerly known as Lady Orchid, out in the farmlands of Alberta. She had been in rough shape, too rough for the conversion project, but perhaps, just perhaps, her center section would be sound. The Lancaster in question, KB-895, was also a Mark 10, also built at the Victory Aircraft Factory in Malton, Ontario, and left for war in January 1945. By March, she was in England and eventually issued to RCAF number 434 Blue Nose Squadron and was assigned to Flight Officer Jenkins and his crew. They had previously flown 11 missions in a British-built Lank, however, KB-895 was to be their permanent aircraft, and so they decide to personalize it. The squadron code letters painted on the side of the aircraft were WLO, so they named the Lancaster We Lady Orchid. However, they soon dropped the We and just painted Lady Orchid on the side of the plane, along with a image of a suitably naked Lady Godiva riding a bomb and carrying two six-shooter pistols. She carried the pistols as a nod to the western heritage of Calgary, Alberta, Jenkins' hometown. KB-895 and her crew began operations and flew a total of five missions by the time the war ended, including trips to Hamburg, Leipzig, Kiel, and Schwanendorf. On the way to Kiel, she performed two maneuvers known as corkscrews in order to evade night fighter attack. 
When the war ended, she served as part of Operation Exodus, helping to bring Allied POWs back home. Then there was training for the possible deployment to the Pacific as part of Tiger Force, which would have been the heavy bomber attack on Japan, probably based in Okinawa. Jenkins, his crew, and Lady Orchid were then ordered back west to Canada. It wasn't an easy flight back across the Atlantic. Due to poor weather conditions and two engine failures, it took 10 days to get back to Dartmouth, Nova Scotia on June 17, 1945. In September, the surrender of the Japanese ended the need for a Tiger Force, and so Jenkins and his crew were demobilized and Lady Orchid was flown to Pierce, Alberta and placed in storage. And that would seem to be the end of the story. Amazingly, two years later, in 1947, Jenkins found out that his old lank was up for sale as war surplus, and he made inquiries about buying it. His plan was to remove some of the instruments and seats and send them to his old crewmates as souvenirs. The Crown agreed to sell him Lady Orchid for $300 as long as he would promise to not try to obtain a certificate of airworthiness. He then had the aircraft moved to a nearby farmer's property where the souvenir removal work could be done. Afterwards, the farmer had intended to turn the fuselage into a shed, but never did, and so sadly the remains of Lady Orchid lay rotting in the Alberta countryside, just waiting to be remembered by Bob Found. In 1953, a salvage crew was dispatched to the farmer's property, and soon enough, the huge center section was removed and loaded on a large flat car for the trip to the de Havilland Aircraft Company, where the repairs would be occurring. In July of 1953, the center section was transplanted in FM-213, and on August 26, 1953, she was test-flown and returned to service where she served as a maritime patrol aircraft with number 405 Squadron Greenwood, Nova Scotia and number 107 Rescue Unit Torbay, Newfoundland for 10 years, retiring from the RCAF in late 1963 and was finally struck off charge on June 30, 1964. Again, it seemed like the end of the life of the storied aircraft. However, she was then purchased by the Royal Canadian Legion Branch 109 in Goderich, Ontario, and placed on pedestals outside Sky Harbour Airport, where she would remain on display until 1977, when the Legion decided that they could no longer afford to maintain the memorial. Luckily enough, the Canadian Warplane Heritage Museum was seeking a lank to restore at the time, and on July 1, 1977, they officially acquired FM-213. It took two full years to dismantle and prepare her for transport to the CWH Museum at the Hamilton International Airport and another 10 years of restoration work to when FM-213 returned to the skies on September 11, 1988. Although she contains the bones of two vintage Lancasters, one being a combat veteran, she wears the colors and designation of a third lank, KB726 VR A of No. 413 Moose Squadron, as a memorial to Pilot Officer Andrew Minarski, RCAF, who posthumously won the Victoria Cross on a raid on the night of June 12 to 13, 1944, over France. She flies every summer for events in North America and has even returned to Europe to fly with her sister Lancaster, PA-474. Let's hope that both continue to fly safely, showing new generations the power and majesty of the Avril Lancaster. And lastly, the next time you experience a setback in your life, think of the utter failure of the Avril Manchester and how, with a little imagination, this disaster of an aircraft became one of the most successful aircraft of all time. Be sure to check out the pictures on the World of Warbirds Facebook page in order to better appreciate what has been described today.